Uh, my wife owns a horse. Uh, can you guess what she named it? Scrawny Matt. Scrawny. Matt. <laughs> oh, who else? Wilbur. Wilbur. She named it Kincaid. What do you think of that? And uh, so uh, one day, jo Jory and Jamie went out riding, and they went uh, up our driveway and across the field and uh, up our road. And the road is pretty steep uh, in certain places. And then uh, they came back, and they decided they would do a little training in the uh, round pen. Uh, but by that point, uh, Kincaid decided he was done. He was tired. And no matter what they tried with their heels and uh, their knees, and you know, he just said, no, I'm, I'm done for the day. Uh, too tired uh, to go on. Uh, they would have had a more success moving a, a, a parked semi. He's not the last to be too tired. Uh, have you ever been too tired to go on? You can blame it on your spouse. Uh, hey, I just had to be uh, late at work one more night. Uh, you can blame it on your parents. Hey, I just have one more job for you to do. Uh, you can blame it on your boss. Just need you to take one more case. Uh, you can blame it on your coach. Just need you to run one more lap. You can blame it on your friend. I need just one more favor. You've done so much. You don't have one more, one more in you. You're exhausted. Uh, David's men were exhausted. They were too tired to fight. Maybe you don't know the account I'm talking about. Most don't, but more need to. It gives great comfort to the worn out. Uh, turn in your Bible uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you want to use our Bibles, it's on page 298. So Saul is trying to kill David. So David has been running as a fugitive for 10 years. And uh, he finally decides the only way I'm going to get away from Saul is to move to Gath. So he moves to the Philistine territory. And the king gives him a city, Ziklag, for him and uh, his 600 soldiers and their families. Uh, David uh, does raids uh, on the uh, cities around that area, God told Joshua to uh, uh, drive out these people. They had had 400 years to repent. They knew about God, but they went a different way. And he said, he said the time is up. Now it's been 800 years. And so David is uh, doing raids on these, uh, these cities. One day they got back to Ziklag, and the city was burned to the ground. And all their wives and children were gone. Uh, it was one of the Amalekites, angry for David doing a raid on one of their cities, were getting revenge. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. They blamed David. I mean, it was David's idea, wasn't it, to move to Gath? It was David's idea, wasn't it, to do raids on the bordering towns? And now one of them was seeking revenge against them? It was David's idea, wasn't it, to uh, go to war against Israel? And that's why they were gone. They had a three days journey away and they left their families vulnerable. He needed to die. They decided to kill him. Uh, David's been here before. Remember when Samuel told Jesse to gather his family. He was going to anoint one of his sons, the next king of Israel. His family left David outside of the meeting, out tending the flocks. Saul hated David, and so he drove him out of the palace. And now David's soldiers have turned against him. Uh, this could be David's worst moment. But he makes it one of his best. While the 600 men decide to kill him, David seeks God. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Uh, it's so important, folks, that we learn to do this. Uh, friends can't always be counted on. Even families can't always be relied on. Uh, 
Your company can turn on a dime and you can be out of a job. Classmates can be fickle. When there's no one else, we must learn to do what David does, turn to God. Uh, when we're out of fellowship with God, what trials have to come our way before we learn to turn back to God? If you're not a Christ follower, how much trouble has to come to your life before you turn to God? David realizes that he has to come back to God. His men are angry at him. He's lost his wife and wives and children. A mark of being a spiritually mature person is to learn not to let sin accumulate. When you get away from God and the Holy Spirit convicts you, come back quickly. This has been the theme in this series. A person after God's own heart is not a person who is perfect. It's a person that when they get off track, they learn to come back quickly and confess their sin. You find strength in God. You put your focus on God, not on your enemies, not on your troubles. Talk to God. Verse 7 and 8, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. Ephod is kind of a garment that goes around the, uh, the shoulders. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. When David calls, God answers. Do you have conversations like this with God? Or are these kind of conversations reserved only for the super high-octane Christians? I'm convinced that God will talk to anybody who takes him up on his offer to pray about everything. With this new confidence that God will help them recover their families, David turns the men's anger toward the raiders who destroyed their city. They saddle up to pursue the Amalekites. Now bear in mind, they're tired. They had just come back from a three-day journey from Jezreel. They don't know which way the Amalekites went, and if not for the sake of their families, they might run out of strength. In fact, 200 do. David and the 600 men with him came to the Bezor Valley, where some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. So the army reaches a brook. The men wade in and they wash their faces and uh, they stretch out on the banks of the water. And David shouts, it's time to move on. And 200 of them whine, oh, we're too tired. You go on without us. I mean, how tired do you have to be to give up the rescue of your own wife and children? The church has its share of such people, nice people, committed Christians. One day or some years ago, they rode with conviction, but now they're exhausted. They're too tired to fight. Maybe several defeats have popped their balloons. Divorce can leave you worn out. Addiction can sideline you. Whatever the reason, the church has a number of people that are too tired. They just want to rest. And the church has a decision to make. What to do with the people that are too tired to fight? Criticize them? Roll our eyes at them? Let them rest for a while, then blow the whistle when we think they've had enough time? Or do we do what David did? David gave them a break. He and his 400 soldiers get on with the chase. They push on, getting more and more discouraged with each mile. Remember, the Amalekites had a three-day lead on them. Then David wins the lottery. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. They refresh him with food and water. David asked him, who do you belong to? 
Where do you come from? He said, I'm an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Carathites, some territory belonging to Judah, and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. He weighed more than he was worth, so when he got sick, his master left him in the desert to starve. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. David asked him for his help, and he's happy to give it. He led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. Uh, David's army swept down on them like cheetahs on gazelles. They killed them, or except for 400 who got away. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. So David goes from being hated to being loved. And the celebration begins. But the best part of the story is still to come. To feel the full impact of uh, this story, think about the feelings of some of the main players in this story. The rescued wives. You've been torn away from your home and dragged through the desert by the Amalekites. You've been terrified for your life and clutched your kids. And then your men sweep over the hill and rescue you. Strong arms take you and put you on a camel. You're thankful to God for the rescue and you begin to look for your husband. Honey? Honey, where are you? Your knight in shining armor says, uh, uh, he stayed back with some of the men at camp. He did what? Uh, he stayed back with some of the guys. Huh. Who do you think's unhappy? How about the uh, rescuers? When David says, mount up, you don't hesitate. You saddle up. You go and rescue the families, leaving the 200 behind that were too tired. When you come back over the ridge, to see the camp and the 200 men, you say, you lazy, good-for-nothings. While you fought, they slept. While you went to fight, they played 18 holes of golf and stayed up late playing Monopoly. You might feel the way some of David's men feel. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. The rescued wives are angry. The rescuers are resentful. And how about the men who are too tired to fight? Cockroaches have higher self-esteem. What does David have to say? His answer surprises us. At Macworld in 2007, Stephen uh, Jobs surprised us. This is an annual event that Apple has and uh, uh, emotionally charged. And he says, We're, Apple's releasing three new products this year. Uh, an expanded iPod with touch screen. A new phone with lots of apps and an internet communicator. We're releasing three products this year. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. Got that? iPod, phone, and internet communicator. It's three products, but it's in one device. And we're calling it the iPhone. Oh, the crowd went crazy. People were laughing and clapping. And 
It was like a holy smokes moment. People were saying, holy smokes, this is unreal. This is so cool. <clears throat> David surprises us. David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and ordinance for Israel from that day to this. Look at what David says. Stayed with the supplies as if he had asked them to do it. He didn't ask them to guard the supplies. They said, we're too tired to go. But he dignifies their decision to stay. David did a lot of great things in his life. Did a lot of foolish things. A lot of bad things. But he did a lot of good things. But this may be one of the best. It's often overlooked. He showed respect to the soldiers who were too tired to fight. Isn't this what a church is supposed to be? A place where people can come to find strength? To recover? Maybe some are too ashamed to speak up. While well, some talk about their victories, others sit silent in weariness. How many are too tired to fight? If you're listed among them, here's what you're going to learn from this account. One, the too tired to fight reminds us to focus on God. When some soldiers are saying, those who stay behind shouldn't get any of the plunder, David says, no. You must not do that with what the Lord, that's the key word in this sentence, with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party. David focuses not on the failures of those who stayed behind, but on God. He's too grateful to, to God to be worried about the wrongs of other people. Parents, when your children are too tired, that may not be the time to push them, but to Teach them to focus on God. Sometime right around this sequence of, events, uh, sequence of events, David wrote Psalm 18. The superscription says he wrote it when he was delivered from Saul and his enemies. Well, Saul's going to be killed the next day. And so he wrote it right around this time. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Now, David focuses on God and gives him the credit. Two, too tired to fight, tells us it's okay to rest. Jesus is not angry with you if you need to rest. He fights when you cannot. Jesus said to his disciples one day, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place to get some rest. On another occasion, he said, come to me, all you who are weary. This is a famous line. You've probably heard it. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Uh, too tired to fight blesses rest. Many Sundays you hear Chris get up here and say, our, our, our design for you is, to, uh, is for everybody that comes here is to gather, grow, and serve. Okay, we want everybody to gather on Sunday mornings, every Sunday possible. We want you to come and worship. We want you to grow. We want you to read the Bible. We hope you might use our journals. Uh, we hope you might join a community group or get involved in a discipleship pair. And then we want you to serve. Serve somewhere in the church or out in the community. But maybe you're too tired. Maybe you can't do the, all those things we want and you, you say you're too tired to serve. I want you to know that is okay. We are just glad that you're here. 
And if you're exhausted and you just can get here just enough to be here, that's plenty. If you're recovering from a tragedy or a trauma or some high stress, we want you to just sit back and relax. Danny Meyer in his book, Setting the Table, tells about uh, a couple that came to 11 Madison Park, one of his about a dozen restaurants that he operates in New York City, and they were celebrating their anniversary. And they came in, the maitre d' gave them a complimentary a glass of champagne. They were happy about that. And then the man said to him, do you know much about wine? He says, I know a lot about our wine list. You want me to help you select a nice one for your dinner? And he said, no, I have a, a question. We have a special champagne at home uh, for us to uh, celebrate after dinner. And uh, when I pulled it out, it was warm. And so I put it in the freezer. Is it going to explode? And the maitre d' says, yes, it's going to explode. And the guy got all excited. He says, honey, I got I to gotta go home and fix this problem. The maitre d' says, no, you're here to enjoy your anniversary. You just stay here. Just give me your address. I'll go home and take care of it. So he goes home and he takes it out of the freezer, puts it in the uh, refrigerator. He puts some dessert chocolates with it and a small tin of caviar and a little note. Happy anniversary, 11 Madison Park. He just let them sit back and relax. And that's our same commitment to you. Wherever you're at, we're just glad that you're here. Three, too tired to fight cautions against pride. David knew that the victory came from God. Let's remember the same. Salvation comes like the Egyptian in the desert. A kindness from God. It's unearned. Who are the strong to criticize the tired? Are you worn out? Take a breather. Are you strong? Don't pass judgment on those who are tired. Odds are there will come a time when you need some rest. And when you do, too tired to fight is a good story to know. Father, thank you for this story. It's kind of one that's kind of like one of those footnote stories. Most people don't know much about it and pass over it. But we want to be what you teach us here, that gracious towards people that are too tired to fight, kind to people that are exhausted or just struggling to be gracious with them like you are with us. Help us to be that kind of church. I want to give you a second just to talk to God right now. Maybe you're exhausted. Tell him thank you that he understands that he uh, gives strength to the weary. And it's okay for you to just sit for a while and gather your strength. Or tell him you want to be gracious towards other people like David and not push people beyond their speed level, but be kind and understanding to other people. You pray. Father, thank you for what we learned through David's actions to be gracious and kind to people who are struggling and tired and exhausted like you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.